live on so it's now live streaming on facebook so hopefully everyone can hear me i can't see it myself on facebook yet so i will have to oh there i can see it now um so good morning good afternoon um my name is gideon hirschfield some of you will know me i'm a hepatologist um in toronto um today it's a real great pleasure um, for those in Canada and those of you around the world who are watching um, uh, just because you're interested uh, to have um, one of the advantages of COVID that we have a guest speaker who is zooming in from northern England from his farmhouse there more, more to the point okay to give us a really entertaining talk I'm absolutely 100% sure on PVC past present and future many of you will know Dave Jones um, because he spent <clears throat> his whole career working on PBC and related diseases and doesn't need much introduction uh, because he's really uh, been a very patient focused clinician um, both on living with PBC and uh, treating the disease better through quantity and quality of life. So I think we're really lucky to have Dave today. So I'm going to hand over to you Dave, I'm going to go on to, to mute and I'll ask you to share your screen. We're going to do PBC past, present and future um, and at the end of that, when you're finished, you're going to stop sharing and then we're going to take questions which have come in via different sources and we're just going to chit chat for 25 minutes. Okay, so thanks a lot, Dave. Mm -hmm. Apologies, this is where my technology fails. Right. Okay. So thank you very much, Gideon. Um, normally, um, he, he would tell you that I'm much, much older than him and, and very old indeed. Um, and uh, But this time he's been very kind to me. So uh, welcome from the north of England. Um, as Gideon says, it's a funny old benefit of COVID. We've all learned to use digital platforms. Hey, we can't see your slides. At the moment, we're learning about NIHR, which I think is really interesting. Um, okay. <laughs> but um, can we switch to your PowerPoint or your Word? Right, that was PowerPoint at my end, I'm afraid. Right. Dave also runs the training program for all the trainees in the UK. Um, <laughs> so he's he's met most of the budding gastroenterologists and hepatologists who want to be the future of PBC. Oh, I can, can you not see this? We can see you. I think you just need to try and choose your PowerPoint slide. Oh, this is, the human interface has failed. If there's a problem, email it to me, but uh, hopefully we can fix it. Uh -huh. I should also tell you an anecdote about Dave's computer. It's not very expensive if it's the same one he's, he usually takes around the world, unless the University of Newcastle has treated you to a new... No, absolutely not. Right. Is that ah. saying from, is that saying PBC now? Yes. Very good. Perfect. I'll go back to mute. Promise that you haven't seen anything about the NIHR at all. That's um, not what you're supposed to see. Very boring as well. Yeah. So, no. Gideon normally tells me how old I am, and um, uh, so he's been very kind to me. So, greetings from the north of England, and it is a fantastic opportunity. I mean, we are winging our way around the world. I'm sure a number of you took part in the pbc -a -thon, and I think just the numbers of people who engaged in all of that is fantastic and I think speaking on behalf of the clinicians and the scientists I think we all love doing that and I think this and the global network is now real albeit in in circumstances that are very difficult so I'm going to do is I'm going to talk about where we are today that's the present I'm going to talk about where we've come from and how that informs what we're doing at the moment and I'm going to just talk about where I think we're going in the future and then I'm open to talk about anything that you want to in terms of questions. I think it's it would be crazy not to um, in a talk about the present um, not talk about COVID and this is very much a personal view from our experience but also from colleagues around the world and I think in, in a way with PBC the news is very good that COVID for the vast majority of people is not a particularly increased um, issue. Um, it doesn't seem to make PBC worse, PBC doesn't seem to make COVID worse, perhaps with the caveat of people with very advanced disease. Um, so 
it hasn't been a particular source of of concern and we, we can be cautiously reassuring to our patients although clearly PVC is not protective and the same issues that apply to everybody apply here. I think we are very worried about a breakdown in care and I think this is a theme across the UK that the centres that are very good at this um, are continuing to cope well with it but have not unfortunately been able to spread to other centres. So resilience in care delivery, and that's told us something about the future. We need to make care delivery a little bit more resilient. Um, and more than anything else, it emphasises what we know already, that you want to avoid cirrhosis if at all possible. And we need more resilient approaches to optimal care delivery. So COVID has told us what we knew already and just reinforced the importance of it. And I think um, one of my themes for the future is better treatments delivered in a much better way to a, a fairer uh, distribution to everybody. So there is a real theme about delivery. So just this seems obvious, but it's actually quite important to think about it. What we're trying to do, um, goals of the treatment, we're trying to get to as close to a normal length of life as is possible, absolutely uh, critically important. As close to a normal quality of life as, as, as is possible, Gideon alluded to this, a great um, focus for me over many years has been around quality of life symptoms and their management. We want to try and use the lowest, least invasive dose treatment that we can. So we don't want to over treat people. And that's traditionally not been an issue with PVC with us, but it's going to start to become an issue as the newer th the theme therapies emerge we need to make sure that we don't add burden through side effects and most of all people want to be involved in decisions and treated with respect and I think again there's been some issues around COVID with a breakdown in the normal relationship building that's so very important in terms of in terms of care delivery so this is my manifesto if you like and I do a lot of training, as Gideon does, and um, we spend a lot of time training the next generation of doctors to not make the mistakes that people made in the past. And I don't overcomplicate it. For me, it's really simple, simple things done well every single time. And I think that's a mantra we keep coming back to again and again and again. Over years of watching all of this, I mean, I first treated people with PBC um, in 1988. Um, I always tell people the very first person I um, diagnosed with PBC was when I was a junior doctor. I just qualified. I was being a smarty pants on a surgical ward and a patient who came in to have their gallbladder removed. I made the diagnosis of PBC uh, and they didn't have their gallbladder out. I still look after that lady in my clinic 32 years later. And I think it's a an extraordinary example of how just how well people can do with PBC and and she and I laugh about you know all of those years ago so we can make a real difference and what makes a real difference effective treatment of disease to stop progression earlier treatment better treatment stop this nip it in the bud and try as much as is possible avoid disease progressing so um, if it does progress if cirrhosis is there maybe because people presented late then you absolutely need uh, to screen for and treat the complications that can kill of course you need to do that but you just don't want to go there if at all possible timely referral for transplant but i tease my transplant colleagues that um, transplant in a way is failed treatment you've fail to control the disease properly. Treat, treatment of PBC should avoid transplant in the vast majority of people. Effective symptom control. And then something I feel really important, that we're not very good, we the doctors are not very good at thinking about life and all of those things that are really important in life. And the example I always use is reproductive health. We're about ill health and its treatment and we do need to have a different perspective about healthy living and its maintenance and, and specialist nurse input into this I think is very important along those lines. How does it go wrong? Um, what are the faults, late or misdiagnosis and the tired old assumptions about alcohol and other causes of liver disease that you're all very familiar with. Delayed treatment, I'm currently dealing with a, 
an unfortunate case of a nice lady who had PBC diagnosed nearly 10 years ago um, and never actually received any treatment for it, um, not any ERSO, not anything else, um, because her doctor said she had no symptoms and therefore didn't need treatment. And one's you know, heart sinks when you hear stories like that, because that was perhaps something that was thought about in the 90s, but not ever. So delayed treatment once the diagnosis is there, under treatment, I'll talk about that a little bit, pointless arguments about the reality of symptoms, um, and then people just referred to transplant too late. Um, and the reason why that's important, I'll come to. So Gideon is very familiar with this on the grounds that he drew this. I think this is an example for our thinking. And, I, and I'm showing this because the thinking is now very clear. And it's important that people do think in a structured way. And this is for patients and for families and for clinicians. And there are three pillars to PVC. You treat it in, in terms of controlling the disease. You stage it and control the risks of cirrhosis and you manage the symptoms pillars one two and three all of which occur after you've diagnosed it so these pillars are a very solid way of thinking about it and then look at how well you're doing in terms of clinical audit now first of all you need to diagnose it and of course that needs clinical suspicion and most people fail at that point they don't think about this in fact pbc is the commonest uh, explanation for a raised alkaline phosphatase in the blood um, for um, women over the age of 40 in the UK. It'll be the same in Canada. So it's really quite a common cause of an elevated alkaline phosphatase, but people still sometimes don't think about it. So people split into three different groups. Um, this is the historical bit. This is how PBC used to present in the days of Sheila Sherlock. It was a, a condition that gave you jaundice, encephalopathy, ascites, varices, coagulopathy. That is in fact very rare in our patient group these days because of management. And if people are heading in this direction, then they're straight through transplant before these develop. So this is very rare now. Once in a while, somebody will be referred a very, very late presenter. Depressingly, sometimes people have presented years before and not been treated. So this is the old view. But the trap here is a lot of clinicians will assume that unless you've got all these things, you can't have PVC, and that's a mistake. Much commoner are people who present with symptoms, um, so reduced quality of life. And the important part of this is these symptoms are not unique to PVC. So itch and fatigue and some mild cognitive impairment. People often worry that they are losing their memory and, and thinking about dementia. That's not the case, but um, people are worried about it. Now, of course, these are not unique to PVC, so people will often... Um, not think of the possibility uh, of a liver disease until um, until you know they've done some further tests and then of course remember asymptomatic disease a lot of people are just found when they have their blood tests done but in terms of diagnosis it's dead simple if you've got raised alkaline phosphatase um, gamma gt uh, and you have an anti-mitochondrial antibody the pbc antibody that equals pbc this is the ultra history of PVC. Um, this is the lady um, who was actually described in the very original description of PVC by Thomas Addison and William Gull, 1857 at Guy's Hospital um, in, the, in the UK, in London. Um, I think it's great because um, Thomas Addison, who is in many ways the father of medicine, he also described Addison's disease, which um, uh, was a problem that John Kennedy, JFK, had. Um, so that's an autoimmune disease of the adrenal gland. He also described um, uh, autoimmune hemolytic anemia. So he described three different autoimmune diseases and therefore was the father of autoimmunity. Um, he was born in Newcastle, less than half a mile away from where we run our clinic. So um, although he uh, trained in Edinburgh and described PBC when he's working in London, he's a Newcastle boy. So all, all PBC roads lead to Newcastle. Thomas Gull, uh, William Gull is equally interesting. He was, in fact, Addison's medical student um, uh, in, in Guy's Hospital in the 1850s. And he too um, went on to um, be famous. He became Queen Victoria's surgeon, um, Sir William Gull in due course. Um, and he um, described anorexia nervosa and he also described thyrotoxicosis. So he was also a bit of a polymath, but he was probably most famous for being the surgeon who was thought to be Jack the Ripper, the mass murderer. So PBC has a bit of a funny combination, a world famous autoimmunity doctor and possibly Jack the Ripper. And um, there is one of those bizarre factoids about PBC, 
which is that um, only three people connected to PBC have delivered one of the prestigious lectures at the Royal College of Physicians in London, um, the, the Goulstonian lecture, which is very prestigious. I delivered that a number of years later because he's much younger than me. Gideon delivered that lecture. And the only other person who's delivered that lecture was in fact, William Gull, Jack the Ripper. So there you go, that's the three of us and our history in PBC. The patient, interesting image, very Victorian haircut. Um, you can see um, the xanthalasma to the fatty pads around the eye that we're still very familiar with the PBC. But they described this actually as a skin condition. So this was um, a, a lady who was thought to have a skin condition around these. And in this wonderful way that only the Victorians would, no anonymity in those days, they named the patient in the case report and she was called Eliza Parachute. And I just think that is the most wonderfully Victorian name, Eliza Parachute, the first patient with PBC. It's a quite extraordinary description. It, when you read this, it's PBC as we understand it. It's a perfect description of the disease. <clears throat> So um, something I thought people would find quite fun is some work that we've been doing about why people get it. And there is a big genetic component to PBC. Um, it is the cumulative effect of lots of small genetic influences. Gideon did the original key study in this um, from the Canadian population, his first time in, in Toronto. Um, so there is a genetic component, but most people with that genetic background don't get PBC. So there is something in the environment that triggers this. And this is some work that one of my colleagues here did mapping it in the Northeast of England. So this is Northumberland, that's the North Sea out of here and that's Newcastle. And this is PBC cases adjusted by population density. So if you didn't do that, um, you would just show that it's commoner in cities than in country areas. So this is a very rural area, PBC is very rare. This is um, the industrial Northeast. Uh, former industrial northeast ex mining areas and the blue is the highest density of PBC and you can correct that for statistical correctness so the red areas are areas of disproportionately high PBC green areas are disproportionately low so significantly lower in this very rural area down in the south of the region and significantly high in a ring around Newcastle and you look at this figure, this is some data on the geography of the northeast of England, and these black dots are coal mines, so people will know coals to Newcastle and all of that big mining area, coal mining in the northeast, all the black dots, same area as the red, and the green area um, here, no black dots at all. And the yellow, which is a, an additive effect to the coal mines, is the presence of cadmium, a metal in the environment, which is disrupted and brought to the surface by mining. Now, cadmium on its own, it's not associated with PVC, but a high cadmium environment in the soil and the water, together with coal mining, explains around about 50% of the risk of PVC in our population now. Nothing to be done with this, nothing to do to change the disease or its management, but I think we're starting to begin to think about maybe why people would get it. Fascinatingly, um, PSC, although there are elements of the disease that are similar, has a completely different pattern. It's common over here in the Lake District in a rural area and is associated not with mining and metals, but is associated with agriculture. So this is a really interesting tool to begin to get clues for why people get the disease. So I think there's some more interesting research. I don't think it will ever change our management. I don't think prevention is possible, but I think it will be an interesting thing. So <clears throat> where are we right now in terms of what we do? These are our pillars. First one is you manage the PBC and the red box here is Urso 13 to 15 milligrams per kilogram. This is mandatory. Uh, all the debate about does Urso work, does Urso not work, should you take it? That is all over. All patients should have UDCA and they should have it at the correct dose, 13 to 15 milligrams per kilogram. And I think it, it helps uh, us to have a very simple and clear message. Um, this is some data from the global um, PBC study group who've done so much to identify the characteristics of PBC, really important piece of, of data. This is the survival free of transplant in people um, who don't get URSO, so their survival is decreased compared to these people who have had URSO. 
And the light blue line here are people who have the correct dose. The dark blue line are people who don't have enough ERSO. So it does make a difference. So the first thing to do if, if you're not winning with PBC is just check the dose um, is the right one, 13 to 15 milligrams per kilogram. Now, at the heart of all of the debate about ERSO is, again, something important to the last 10 years and the history of it, but now is mainstream thinking, um, is that there are winners and losers with ERSO. Um, and that there are some people who respond well to it, and there are some people who don't respond well to it, and that makes a huge difference in terms of what happens. So I'll, I'll do it around Toronto in tribute to the audience today. These are the Toronto blood criteria, and these are people who, whose bloods improve to meet that threshold in terms of alkaline phosphatase, um, after ERSO treatment, those are the people who, whose biochemistry meets that, that criteria set, these are the people who don't, and this is survival. So you can see that it's a very clear difference, but these are the same people using all the criteria, all the criteria work. Um, all the criteria work, they are nuanced differences, but basically if your blood tests improve a lot, you do very well. If your blood press don't improve a lot, particularly if they were very bad to start with, you don't do so well. And that's at the heart of how we manage the disease now. And this is again some work from the Global PBC Study Group, which is uh, interesting. So where do these cutoffs come from? Well, it is interesting. If you look at, um, if you look at this, this is alkaline phosphatase, and these are the levels over in the Global PBC Study Group, and this is the likelihood uh, at a year of follow-up of, of dying or needing a transplant. The answer is, that risk goes up right from the upper limit of normal from alkaline phosphatase. So actually, to an extent, clinically, all of those cutoffs are a bit arbitrary. Um, so anything above the upper limit of normal has some risk associated to it. And this is um, a really important paper. I always say this and embarrass Gideon, but this is a really important piece of work um, from the global group earlier this year. And it looks at taking that even further, what happens to people with a bilirubin in the normal range and what it suggests is that as well as a normal alkaline phosphatase and a normal bilirubin, you probably need to even aim for a lower than the upper limit of normal bilirubin. So we are heading clinically towards the era of, of wanting to see normal blood tests after ERSO in order to be happy with the level of treatment. Now, this is some data that um, not even Gideon has seen, but was involved with. Um, uh, as part of the UK PBC and it's work in progress, but I thought I'd show you because you'll find it interesting. And this is to take about uh, 500 of our patients from across the UK with defined clinical state and to split them into all of those different groups. So these are the incremental additional people who progressively meet you know, higher and higher cutoffs. So these are the people with the very worst liver function test, Paris 1. Here are the people down with normal liver function tests. And these are an inflammatory marker. It doesn't really matter which one it is. It's true for about 19 of them. And what you see is a stepwise increase. So all of these criteria, the higher your alkaline phosphatase, the more inflammation you have, the more biological activity. But look at these. These are the people who meet every ERSO response criteria, but still have slightly abnormal LFTs. They are significantly different to the people with normal LFTs. So in addition to the clinical data from the global group, we now have mechanistic data saying that only normal is normal. I think that's the future. And actually, we do use ERSO widely. It's a very important treatment. Um, it's you know, important thing for us to, to use, but we do need to be realistic about its limitations. This is, again, some of our protein inflammation data. And the thing to look at here is this is the number of proteins that normalize um, completely in patients who take ERSO for PBC. And it's one out of 450 that we looked at. So ERSO improves in most people the activity of the disease in terms of inflammation, but it normalizes a small fraction. So ERSO is good, but only up to a point. So hence, in practice, now standard practice is to assess whether people have responded or not and add in second line therapy if they don't. And this is mandatory now. Everyone gets ERSO, everyone then gets assessed in terms of their response. And if they don't respond, we need to do something. This is now present, 
and in the future it's all about delivering this in practice. In terms of what treatments you give people, there are essentially two licensed therapies that we use, one licensed but not licensed for PVC, one licensed for PVC, and then there are a number of experimental drugs and a number of trials, and I would encourage people um, who are interested to explore being in those trials because they have generated enormous progress for PVC patients. Something that's just worth remembering is this concept of not responding to URSO is not uniformly distributed in the population. It is distributed more in younger patients. The younger you are at presentation, the less likely you are to respond to URSO. And we use a mantra which is 50 at 50. Um, if you present with PVC below the age of 50, you actually have a less than 50% chance of responding to URSO. So one of the things we always tell to the clinicians is always look very carefully at PBC patients who were presented at a young age. The disease is a more tricky, more aggressive process. And almost certainly this explains why we still transplant people with PBC, not nearly as many as we did, but we still do. They always, always, always present below the age of 50. So here are the two big trials that, that guide therapy now. One is the trial of abetacolic acid and the other is the trial of bezofibrate. And uh, we can, to an extent, extrapolate into the other fibrates. So um, where fibrates are available is an issue in Europe. We have access to bezofibrate in North America. Um, Phenofibrate is, is more easily available. Uh, less data on that. But I think there's a broad class effect. These are both trials that took people who were non-responders to URSO, defined in slightly different ways. That is important because the bezofibrate trial used people with a slightly less severe form of the disease. Um, and what they did is took people who were non-responders and essentially added in a second treatment and saw how many of those you could convert to a responder. So this is the abetacolic acid data. Around about 50% of people given either of the two dosing regimes went from being a non-responder to a responder. This is not normal test. These are improving enough by the criteria that were used, about 10% of uh, of people given a placebo. So a clearly significant benefit in terms of flipping people from blood tests that are too high to acceptable, although the caveat is that we may be revising what acceptable looks like in the future. After that, it just pretty much carries on really. So you get a very fast response in terms of alkaline phosphatase that then carries on um, as far as we've now followed up, which is four years. So people don't really develop any new problems. They don't wear off in terms of its effectiveness. It doesn't particularly get any better than it was to start with. So it pretty much continues. Now there is an issue with the itch and that's a problem with the drug. It's a very manageable itch. Gideon and I wrote some guidance for clinicians, put it on the website in the UK for how you can manage this. And it's been very helpful. And in practice, this is a manageable issue. But if you go into it unwary, um, you can um, see itch happening quite early. This is the itch level in people taking the higher dose. Interestingly, by 12 months, it's worn off. Um, in, the, in the actively treated people compared to the placebo group. But it can certainly hit people at the beginning. And the advice is to get people on effective therapy early on before they use OCA if it looks like it's going to be a problem. So it's something to be aware of. More of a problem in the trials than it has been in practice in, in use in, in the clinic. This is bezofibrate. This is the Bezurso trial, um, also published a little bit later. And what they showed, if anything, was a more dramatic improvement in alkaline phosphatase, but, and it's important, but they started it with a lower level of disease activity. And they, for the first time, presented data on normalization uh, of patients in terms of their biochemistry, which I think is the new direction. By 12 months, a quarter of people are normalized. So again, we are not getting to what we want to see, which is the vast majority of people normalizing, but I think it's the right way to think. But the caveat is this does not suggest that bezofibrate is more effective than OCA. It suggests that a trial that used slightly less severe patients has a particular effect. So they aren't head-to-head -head comparisons. And we're all coming across the challenge of this with the various different um, trials of vaccines for COVID where we're looking at success rates, but they're not directly comparable trials. So just be careful.
One of the things to watch out for in fib rates is that whereas Oka just chugs along, not doing very much in terms of side effects, if you're going to get any problems, you get itch earlier. Visa fib rate can have cumulative problems over time, and in particular, renal dysfunction, which was seen in the Bezoso trial and certainly was reported in a 10 year study where Visa fib rate had been given mainly for lipid control. It was an old fashioned lipid. Um, treating therapy so you do have to monitor for both river, liver function which can sometimes get worse as well as better and also um, renal function so it's not a clean drug it's a useful drug but it has its issues. Um, there was a signal in this trial in relation to itch um, although it wasn't a population selected for itch but what you can tell is that the placebo group at 12 months had more itch if anything than the active treated group but actually pretty much none of them had an itch to start with. All you can extrapolate from that is that um, bezofibrate does not cause itch, I don't think, in the way that ochre does. And I'll come back to the unfolding of the itch story for the future in the sec. Something that I think is really important, this is some work we do with the PBC Foundation in the UK, and it's about the, the real challenge with all of this. So um, we've crafted, I think, very sensible, very practical guidelines. But the problem is, are they going to be used in practice? And there is evidence that clinicians are not very good at putting into practice what what the guidance says is best practice. This is some data from around 600 patients with PBC. The question was a simple one. Did you discuss your alkaline phosphatizing last clinic visit? Remember what I said at the beginning, this guides our therapy now and you must be involved in treatment decisions. So ergo, you should know and be involved in discussions in relation to your alkaline phosphatase. 50% of people, it wasn't discussed. OK, half of them, it probably was. And in about half of those, the doctor initiated the discussion. That's great. Those are doctors who discuss alkaline phosphatase like we would tend to do. And they're likely to do it for all their patients. In 10 percent of cases, the patient started it fine for them, not so fine for the next patient, doesn't know what to do. And the plea for patients was guidance and information. What is it you're aiming for to help guide? They're happy to challenge doctors, but they don't necessarily understand what, what they should be saying. And this is where I think normal is normal, probably starts to be a very helpful mantra. So that's pillar number one. And if we get this right, early enough treatment that's effective, it makes probably all the rest irrelevant. But there will be patients who present later, will be patients who don't respond to the treatment as we use it now. So it's really important to know about risk, to screen for cirrhosis complications if they're there, and to transplant or refer for transplant at the right time. This is a simple graphic, the global group have got data to support this but this is a teaching graphic I use with our fellows. The fundamental issue is that other types of liver disease like varietitis or NASH progress at a progressive way. They're predictable, you know how it's going to deteriorate over time. PBC tends to stay looking mild until a point when it deteriorates and then can deteriorate rapidly. You start at the same point, you end at the same point, but at every point in between, the PBC patient looks like they're doing better. And this can trap doctors, trap the unwary who think, oh, somebody's got a bilirubin of 30, you know, that's no big deal. I've got an alcohol liver disease patient with 300 and they seem all right. No, and a bilirubin of 30 is a big deal. And Gideon, one of the things that, that Gideon has said for years, and I absolutely, absolutely agree with, is just absolutely watch any bilirubin that is rising even if it's still in the normal range and I would always want to know in our catchment area for transplant anybody whose bilirubin is rising because I worry that they are approaching this point so the biggest disaster in you know advanced PBC management is missing the boat for transplant so push 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 if clinicians are not taking a rising bilirubin seriously then challenge them and then final on symptoms very important. It's been a passion of, of my life, both um, itch and fatigue. Itch is, is a more straightforward thing to treat and is a more rewarding thing to treat. Fatigue is really challenging. And I'll talk a little bit about what we do at the moment and where this is going in the future. But remember, quality of life um, is a big deal and it also is age associated. So the younger you are at presentation, the more likely your quality of life is to be impaired. I suspect this is partly more aggressive disease, but also a greater expectation out of life. Um, um, 
given the opportunity, I would rather not to go out in the evening. I'd rather have an early night because I'm, as Gideon points out, very old. But um, if I was 20, I think I'd be very fed up if I couldn't go out and have a social life. And I think that's a really important thing to remember is there's an expectation. Where's my life going is a is a sentiment that you know we hear all the time. So again, watch out for younger patients, y younger people. It is an issue. So there's real progress coming with itch. So this is the most advanced of the agents, which is the GSK drug, um, which is now um, it, for advanced even further from this. This is some work Gideon and I did a number of years ago um, and it's just met its next trial endpoint. So this is a drug um, that blocks bile acids being taken up from the gut. So it works like a super version of Questran. Um, and it really does work. Um, so it really drops the pruritus score, as you can see down here. Um, and this is progressing. So this is going into phase three trial, more advanced trial. And then I alluded to this, that there was a sort of carrot dangling in the air about bezafibrate from the from the Bezurso trial. This is about to be published. This is the data from the um, a Dutch group who did a formal trial of bezafibrate given not to improve biochemistry but to target itch and what you can see is that you get a really quite significant reduction in severity and a drop from seven to four is actually a very meaningful um, impact on itch. My only caveat with this is it's only three weeks and remember this issue about long-term potential sort of safety with it. So three weeks is not a long-term um, treatment for itch which can be lifelong and only 50% of people got the reduction they wanted to see so there's still work to do but this is a prescribable drug right now and we are already using it to manage itch so this is some real progress and one of the thoughts that um, you know is out there now is where does this fit into the ladder and um, um, we still use Questran as a first choice for itch because it's very safe, it's not very nice, and it's limited in its effectiveness, but it's a very safe drug, and it is the drug that's licensed for this. So we would still recommend using that, but if it's not going to work or it doesn't work for you as a patient, then we would move to a second-line treatment. Traditionally, we use an old-fashioned antibiotic called rifampicin. I suspect bezafibrate may, over time, um, come into that place and actually replace um, the need for rifampicin but that I think is is up for debate. One of the things I showed you the, the issue about not talking about alkaline phosphatase um, this is some worrying UK data this is about again what we call real world data this is real patient data from many thousands of patients across um, the UK in the source data over here cross-checked using patient databases and what that tells us is something quite worrying that of people with persistent itch, this is more than three days per week, um, only under 40% of people getting Questran, 10% of people getting rifampicin, and less than 10% getting anything else. So at least 40% of people with persistent itch in the UK are getting no treatment for their itch. And so before we get on to fancy treatments in the future, um, if people are not going to prescribe the simple things, they're not going to prescribe the sophisticated things. So in the future, one of the things we absolutely have to nail is getting the right treatments out to everybody with the condition. Simple things done well all the time. So I don't quite understand why people don't treat this. I, I don't understand um, uh, when we do educational thing for the doctors, the danger is we, we encounter those people who are interested enough to come to the educational stuff. And it's the don't know, they don't know doctors are the ones that we worry. And I, I really believe that patient groups have got a very important role to play in educating their clinicians in the nicest possible way about what matters in this condition. So remember, as for controlling the disease, for controlling itch, there is a, a difficulty about the reach of therapy. And then fatigue. And at the moment, it's supportive. And that is important, but, but it's frustrating because we would like to be able to do much more. So we have a standard approach called TRACE that we, we educate the clinicians. And I always explain, literally, I have this as a graphic I show to people in the clinic to explain what we're going to do. So the first step is to treat the treatable. This is to treat itch, keeping you awake at night. This is to treat anemia because of um, uh, you know, celiac disease, which is associated with PBC, or thyroid disease, which is associated with fatigue. So those are all things that make fatigue worse and are themselves treatable. So treat those first. 
Then you ameliorate a couple of things that can make fatigue worse. Depression can occur, can make it worse. People can have problems with their blood pressure medications. And people can also have sleep disturbance. So think very carefully about sleep. And then coping and then empathizing. I'll talk about that in more detail. And this is for our registrars. Don't fail before you start. Um, if you tut and roll your eyes and say you only look after proper problems or don't, you know, I'm tired because I was on call last night. We've certainly had fellows who've done that. Gideon knows who I'm talking about. Um, and um, that doesn't help anybody. So you really have to work with patients. So that's an education thing for the patient. What I mean about coping, it's your problem that I mean that in the nicest possible way. Take ownership of the problem and take ownership of the solution. Um, I was watching with my kids a film called The Martian at the weekend about Matt Damon, who was a Mars astronaut and um, ended up being left behind on Mars. And um, what he did was roll up and uh, roll up his sleeves, come up with a plan to survive the year until they could come and pick him up. Don't regret or be bitter or fed up about, you know, take control of the situation and make it as good as you can to own the problem own the solution and coping is part of that so energy management treat it as a valuable resource spend it wisely plan your days fatigue is better in the morning so plan the day accordingly so people often run out of energy as the day goes on so make sure that if you've got important meetings have them in the morning if you want important things do them in the morning try and avoid shift work if you can because that's always a struggle own the problem come up with a plan own the solution don't be bitter because because this has happened one of the things i'm frequently saying in the clinic is in life we all have to play the hand we're dealt we are here to help with it but ultimately you need to kind of come to terms with it and own it and then in terms of lifestyle one of the things that we are very clear about is that social structures are very important so we've got some data that social isolation happens very easily that's why we're very worried with covid at the moment people getting isolated lockdown and things so that's why digital networking has been such a boon like-minded people experiencing similar things a, a problem shared as a problem half so keep your social networks going exercise i think there's now some very good data coming along to suggest that this is beneficial but people can be challenged it can be challenging to do it and then people often are interested in diet and antioxidant and vitamins and i think these are all areas where we need to be able to do much more empathy is important this is empathy not sympathy we don't want doctors to feel sorry for people they need to understand this is a real problem and we need to work together with people and just avoid those disconnects that 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 lead to people not feeling able to discuss it oh it can't be your pvc because your your blood tests are normal on earth so we know that urso doesn't improve the fatigue so it's important for clinicians to work with people and for you to not hide problems from clinicians otherwise you end up with a folie à deux where everybody ignores the problem um, what we would love more than anything else, though, is a specific therapy for this. And I, I think there's a very interesting piece of work, um, which is going to come to trials in the UK very shortly, um, which is about perhaps we do have the answers already, but we just have used them in the wrong way. And this is some mouse data that we've now repeated in human cultured cells. And these are mice that are cholestatic, so they have bile duct obstruction, so have some of the features of PBC. It's not PBC, but they have a, an extreme form of poor bile flow. And these animals have behavioural patterns that are typical of brain fatigue, of central fatigue. And the, the important thing here is the higher the, the blobs are in this test, the better. And so animals that don't have any treatment are way down. They should be around the two thirds level, 65% in this test. The details don't matter. But what you see is unfortunately suppression of behavior. They're unable to do things. Treat them with ochre and they return to normal. OK, so ochre given early in the disease can actually return animals to a normal behavior pattern. And um, ursodeoxycholic acid and bezofibrate um, don't do that. 
And what's happening in these animals, I think, is absolutely fascinating, which is that they are getting what's called senescence, um, the production of zombie type cells in their neurons. And this is important because senescence is thought to be the process that gives you bad bile duct problems in PBC. So you can stain the liver for these um, dead but not functioning cells um, and those are integral to PBC but exactly the same process is happening uh, in the brains of these animals and it also happens in cultured human neurons that if you treat them with serum from PBC patients they become senescent. The critical thing is treat them with ochre and you reverse that. So you take cells that are in a state of zombification and you can return them to normal as long as you treat it early in the disease. And I wonder why the reason the reason why ochre is not as effective as symptoms as we would like it to be, it has no effect on fatigue, given the way we use it at the moment, is we are simply using it too late in the disease. And one of the things that I think is very interesting, we're just working through, is that actually in this normalization of zombie cells, actually beza fibrate makes it worse, not better. And I think it's going to be one of the things we're going to have to think about when we are comparing um, visa fibrate and ochre. Uh, ochre appears to work with the key disease process to improve it, whereas visa fibrate may treat the, the poor bile flow, but it may actually not have the effect that we want on zombie cells. Where do I think this fits in? Too early to say, trials are about to begin. I think if we ever did have an effective therapy for fatigue, we would need to be helping people to rehabilitate. I think you get muscle problems, you lose physical condition through being fatigued, so rehabilitation is going to become very important. But I do think in the same way as we are now cracking sequentially the disease to treat it better, we are now cracking itch with new drugs and exciting new therapies and approaches so that we've got lots of options for treatment in the future. We don't know how to use them all. We don't know which is the most effective, but we have options. So I think that fatigue will be increasingly treatable in the future. And I think that remains, if you like, the holy grail for therapy in PBC. And then the last thing, um, I don't want to give lots of complex conclusions, but it is um, a mantra that somebody once told me that in life, um, you look clever by making things complicated, but in reality, you look clever by making things simple. And I think Gideon and I agree on 99.9% .9 of PBC, um, but we absolutely agree on this one, is that getting the simple right things to everybody will be the most important first step. And once we've done that, then we can easily add in better therapy. So don't overcomplicate this. Get this out to everybody. And as I said before, I think groups like yourselves and the patient groups around the world have a really important role to play in spreading information to clinicians, to other patients, to the broader community. So um, I hope that was vaguely interesting, a little bit of history, a lot of the present, and a sense of where this goes in the future. But just to say, with all of these things, it takes time to get there. Um, uh, we've seen with COVID, you can produce a vaccine in over a weekend and evaluate it and get it approved in the morning. I'm afraid here in the real world, it does take time to do it right, because by Lord, you don't want to do it wrong. So at that point, I'll shut up and, and take any questions. You so, want. so Dave, you might want to just stop showing the screen. Um, but I'm sort of, now I'm live and I've got my video on. I think you've got your video on. I can I have been watching Facebook Live and I have seen some of the questions. But I'll apologize in advance if people's questions don't um, directly get addressed because we, we're sort of running short of time. But also, I can't see all the questions at once. But I want to finish, A, by thanking Dave, but, but really for a fantastic talk. And secondly, by just agreeing with him. You know, one of the things that I've learned over time is, you know, and this is a real classic era of uh, academics and ivory towers, it is exactly what Dave said, get the simple things right first. And one of the biggest boons for PBC yeah. was the development of a new drug. And actually, the vast majority, the majority of people who benefited from that new drug never got the drug. Um, because, you know, the amount of education that we've done on PBC has been phenomenal. Um, and it wasn't going to come in any other ways in the real world. And, um, you know, uh, get the simple things right, get a diagnosis. So, Dave, I wanted to just sort of pretend that we were back at university, actually. Um, and I'll try and come up with a question. I can't remember that long ago, I can tell you. Yes. 
but you know, in the days of a tutorial, we, we might just ask you some simple questions about PBC, which come up, which you know, I'm going to take advantage of. And I think sometimes that's what patients would help to, to know as yeah. well. Can you, you know, we have a name, primary biliary cholangitis. Yeah. Could you just explain why it's called primary, why it's called biliary, and why it's called cholangitis? Um, because I think it, that's really important just to get the name right. I mean, and I'm not being sort of uh, making fun, but, you know, sometimes our referring doctors can't be bothered to yeah. get the name right. And that goes back to the simple things. If you can't get the name right, how are you going to treat it correctly? Um, yes. So primary. So this is a, a bit of old fashioned doctor speak. Um, so primary was always used um, as a term for when you didn't understand why something happened. So, um, so primary biliary cirrhosis, as was, was in distinction to a well-described condition of secondary biliary cirrhosis, which is where you got liver scarring after you had uh, bile duct problems. So, <clears throat> so primary gives it a sort of a sense of you know what's going on that isn't true. So it was, in a sense, primary because it, it wasn't the other type that was a very clearly associated one. And, and remember, going back into... The, the days of Sheila Sherlock, this was all done on post-mortems and op at operation. We now know it's driven by the immune response, but we didn't know that when the term was invented. So it's primary because that's a word for we don't know what the cause is. Now, biliary is correct because this is fundamentally a disease of bile. Um, and I think actually the more we go on, the more clear it is that bile is the driver of many of these problems. So this is a disease of bile production and bile actions. And it's what bile does in the bile duct and also when it gets out into the circulation. So biliary means of the bile duct. And I think that bit is absolutely correct. It's a biliary disease. And cholangitis is a fudge. Um, and um, it's a fudge because it's a better word probably than cirrhosis. Um, which is a bad word for PBC because 90% of PBC patients don't have cirrhosis and people instantly associate the word with alcohol. So um, two wrongs don't necessarily make a right, but primary biliary cirrhosis was problematic. It goes back to the 50s when everybody with PBC was diagnosed with cirrhosis. And so it ended up with lots of different debates about, um, about you know, is it alcohol and all of that. So the name was changed to, whilst keeping the abbreviation to primary biliary cholangitis. Cholangitis means inflammation of the bile duct. Um, so you could argue that this is um, inflammation of the bile duct, bile duct, um, and so therefore is not a great term. But we did think that the term, the abbreviation was useful um, because otherwise, if you had a completely new abbreviation, you would then have to say that's the condition that we used to be called primary biliary cirrhosis, and then you've reintroduced the word cirrhosis. So I, I think it's, it's a disease. The message for people is that you haven't caused it. Nobody's caused it. It's a combination of some inherited factors you got from your parents and then some environmental oddities that are out there that you could have done nothing about. So in that sense, primary is useful. Um, you couldn't have done anything about it. I see that the Nash community are getting in on the name change. So I think they've called it MASH now, haven't they? Um, yeah, MASH will be a MASH. And I, and I was just, you know, teasing them because I think sometimes they forget that actually most of the patients don't go to big teaching hospitals. No, so they exactly. should really think about what it means to the patient and the doctor that they actually see in front of them, as opposed to the 10 people in the world who give all the presentations on NASH. Um, but that was really helpful. So to sort of follow on to that, patients would like a cure. Yeah. Okay? To have a cure, usually you need to know a cause. Yeah. So do you see anything in the work that you've done today in this huge efforts you've been, all the different things you showed us in the talk, that means that we may one day really know what causes PBC and can cure it? Or do you think that we should probably not really be um, that focused on the concept of cure, but much more focused on the concept of control? So very good question. And I think we are at the moment in control. I mean, we are focusing on control. And at the moment, we're not controlling enough. So there's still mileage to go with that. Um, I think, and then of course, there's the other question of prevention. So um, can you ever prevent it? Um, I think that's going to be very difficult because it's a rare condition. And 
how you would screen for the risk factors with it. So it, it would be nice to find some e some unique trigger, like a particular drug that we didn't need to have anymore that you could no longer use. That would be helpful, but I don't think you're going to find that. Um, so I don't think we're going to be able to prevent it, other than possibly, possibly in family members of people who've got PVC a little bit. Cure. I think, for me, and I think it's a really interesting question, I think there is something about this process of senescence, these zombie cells that arise, that seem to drive the disease process. And I think if we can understand why some people develop those cells and other people don't, and what those cells then do, then I think you will be much closer to be able to switch off the engine for the disease process. And I think, and I don't, I know Gideon and I agrees with this because we've talked about it. I think that will need one of two things, either a drug to, that prevents senescence given really early in the disease, okay? Or alternatively, some combination of therapy where you control mild problem also. So it's going to need a different model to the one that we've got. The worry I've got is will you ever see people early enough to be able to do that? It's fine in mice because you know when the process started. And the worry is somebody who turns up with mild PBC, how how long have they had that? Oliver James, who set the clinic up in Newcastle, he used to say spotting the beginning of PBC was like looking for a needle in a haystack when you don't know what a needle looks like and you aren't sure about a haystack. So when did this all start and has an a, a irreversible step already been taken long before we see people? So I think we need to constantly push the envelope into understanding what early high risk looks like and see where we go. But the final frontier may be the most difficult one, which is it is a very slowly developing disease and is asymptomatic for a long time. And so how do we know in the people we need to treat? So I think... I I'd like to think it's possible. I think it will be a struggle, but I think we can take away the, the need for transplant and prevent cirrhosis by really, really effective control. So it's not a low aspiration, it's a high aspiration, but it's not perhaps the dream aspiration. So I'm gonna I keep on a theme, I'm gonna keep on the letter C, okay? okay I did this thing for PSC, which sick, no, the six Cs. No, I wanna move from, you talked about cholangitis, cirrhosis, the cure, I want to talk about care. I want yeah. to understand, you know, in North America, most patients don't live close to their doctors. Yeah. I wanted to give, I wanted you to reflect on the pathway from diagnosis and care between GP, gastroenterologist and hepatologist. So what we know from experience is that distance doesn't necessarily come into it. So some of the biggest disasters for management we've seen are people who live within 10 miles of our clinic, uh, but, but they might have lived a thousand miles away in terms of the lack of awareness and thought. So, so geography distance um, can often is a, an issue, but also interest and awareness distance is, is as big a problem. So I think the, 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 as I always say, in a consultation between a patient with PBC and a doctor, there are two people, one of whom has much more vested in the consultation than the other. Um, and leaving out people like myself and Gideon and Mark Swain and all of the people who care about this. For most clinicians, the patient has much more vested in this than they do. So I think the, the, the bit of advice, and I think this is where North Americans are much better than people in the UK, um, I mean, in the UK, it's terribly, you know, after you, no, after you, no, after you, and don't want to upset the doctor. So I think be much clearer about what you want. From the doctor's perspective, I think it's easy for us to say, I spend my life on PVC, it's easy for me to say what perfect looks like, even though we do not do that. I mean, nobody's perfect. Um, I can understand how people who are dealing with all manner of different conditions find it a struggle. So what we have to do is to find some way of being able to share knowledge, to mobilize knowledge so that it reaches that consultation. And for me, some sort of digital support pathway is the way to do it, sat nav for management, if you like, where all of the knowledge in the guidelines we've written is there in an easily digestible way that guides you through it. And so essentially there should only be one step in or two steps in PBC. One is to diagnose it and clearly awareness raising about the diagnosis is important. And after that, there should be a Canadian national pathway 
um, that people go on to where you have that information on your smartphone, your doctor has that information, and you're all following the same script. And that takes you all the way from basic therapy to post-transplant management. But you don't see all the later steps unless you need to do that. And I think we've learned something with COVID about the, the power of digital technology. And what it's done is make us do things differently quickly and actually I think it now is a wonderful chance to do that and I think we have the knowledge um, of what you need to do there's a digital element to it and you then need to get uptake but this acceptance is there and I think I could see a day when people very politely go along and and say if it's okay with you I've heard about this national pathway supported by the Canadian PBC Society and the, the PBC clinicians in Canada I would like to go onto that pathway and after that there's a fail safe built into it so I think it's a digital technology I don't think it's reasonable to know expect all doctors to know the nuances of PBC management but they should know how to be able to access it and if you're not getting that then you should feel comfortable to raise that I think, I think that's for me the answer I agree we've, we've got a few minutes to run over so if you've got time Dave we'll keep yeah, chatting yeah. For just another five or ten minutes only but I agree totally we, we need to harness technology here yeah. Um, yeah. to say that we can do an, a lot of education but you can't uh, you can't expect everyone to be an expert in everything but technology can break down barriers and, yes. you know, both of us know that our clinics have been virtual for nine months now and yeah. our patients have still started. Uh, so they've still yeah. started OCA. They've still yeah. been recruited to clinical trials. We've we've got the Canadian yeah. network where we've consented them electronically and yeah. we've sent them questionnaires by email and they've taken part. Yeah. And so it's for us to sort of disrupt the pathways that really exist to feed the system and to support the doctors, not the patients. And you know, it's, it's funny, Dave, because you and I, you may remember, I actually applied for something and we didn't get it in the UK through the NIHR to have a virtual program in autoimmune liver disease. Yeah. Um, and it wasn't seen as a priority. I can understand <laughs> that. But actually, we're, we're headed there now, aren't we? We, we can do a yeah. lot of this virtual. Yeah. So I hope, okay. particularly yeah. in the big countries like North America, where geography is a big issue in North America, um, uh, that we would um, be able to help patients with that. So then I, I wanted to move on to two, to, before we talk about symptoms a bit, I just wanted to ask you to help patients just on two points, really, um, because I think this is key to advocating and key to the diagnosis and then the treatment. What, what is AMA? Yep. Okay, and why is it important? And, and what is alkaline phosphatase? And why okay. is it important? And then after that, I think we could talk a little bit about symptom control. Dreaded doctor speak. Yeah. So... AMA is anti-mitochondrial antibody, and it's a historical oddity. It was um, noted in the 1950s. It's a protein in the blood. It's an antibody, so the, the things your immune system produces in response to infections, but also can be produced in response to your body's own proteins. And they are something you see in an autoimmune disease where the immune system recognizes you. So it's an anti So if you go and have a tetanus vaccination, you have an antibody in your blood against tetanus toxoid, if tetanus gets into your blood, it mops it all up. It's the way immune memory works. For some reason, in some situations, people produce antibodies and T cells, which have got a lot of publicity around COVID, against yourself. And one of those reacts with part of a cell called the mitochondria, which is the battery for the energy for the cell. And that's an anti-mitochondrial antibody. And this is what's called pattern recognition. This is... Um, somebody in the 1950s recognized that people with PBC had this rather odd antibody. So it is very, very, very useful for diagnosis because 95% of people with this antibody have PBC and 95% of PBC patients have the antibody. So to all intents and purposes, the antibody equals the disease. And so it's a cheap test, any lab can do it, and it's very accurate for diagnosis. And so it's really useful as a test. What it doesn't do is actually cause the disease or make the disease worse in any way at all. So a high level of the antibody doesn't make the disease worse, a lower level of the antibody doesn't make the disease better, but it's a really useful marker for what's going on. There are some other antibodies that you get around nuclear um, structures in the cell. 
but also other things like centrum. So there are some other antibodies, um, but they are less common than AMA. So AMA is a really useful tool to help you diagnose PVC, but it doesn't cause the disease mechanism. Getting rid of the antibody doesn't help people. So it's one of your cardinal blood tests. Alkaline phosphatase is also a protein, also measured in the blood, but it's not an antibody. It's an enzyme. It's one of those proteins that helps metabolism. And it is produced by cell, a number of cells in the body, including the bile duct cells. When the bile duct cells are stressed or damaged, they release alkaline phosphatase into the blood where you can measure it. So a higher level of alkaline phosphatase indicates, amongst other things, that you've got more bile duct cells dying. And so therefore the level goes up. So it's a, a monitor, if you like, of cell injury, although it's a little complicated because you can get it with bone disease and a variety of other things. Put the two together and you get a very high likelihood that if you've got evidence your bile ducts are being damaged and an antibody associated with bile duct damage, you put those two together and that is overwhelmingly likely the PBC. But again, alkaline phosphatase does not harm you. Having a high level in your blood does not hurt you. Um, it's not harmful. It is a marker for what's going on. So they are two blood tests that happen to be incredibly useful for diagnosing the disease and alkaline phosphatase but not AMA is useful for monitoring the disease although neither of them is perfect because um, because they don't give you all the information that you want so they are markers and we do mea culpa do casually fly these terms around um, but they are very useful but don't don't worry if your AMA level goes up or goes down. It's it's just how active your immune system right. is. Anyway. So I think, you know, and it just as a sort of uh, a little bit of history, and you actually mentioned it in your first patient you diagnosed, before, pa before AMA was a test that was widely available, people had to have an operation to diagnose PVC. They did indeed. And, you know, and that that's actually what was the major advance is that now we can diagnose PVC on blood tests. And the second thing is, although I know that neither you nor I have flown in a plane now for nearly a year, okay, but I mean, I, you know, I like the concept of the um, 200 club Yes. Um, when it yes. comes to the alkaline phosphatase. There are lots of different ways of measuring yeah, risk yeah. in PVC. But if you're a patient, um, broadly speaking, and I'm not telling you that, you that you have to have more than one treatment, but broadly speaking, one of the concepts that Dave and I quite like is, is are you in the 200 club? Is your alkphos above or below 200? Okay, because yeah. that gives you some sense of where yeah. you are in terms of risk. And we'd like broadly to have our patients in the under 200 club, even better if it's normal. And we, we talked about that already. But that's a good starting point when you're talking to your doctor who's looking after you. Yes. Um, because it's very easy to remember for you and them. Yeah. And if they don't know the answer, it's very easy for them to ask someone else to guide them as to what should happen to you. Okay, just and that, that, that was the point. message from the patient confidence thing is that right, what they right. wanted was a simple thing that they could ask their doctor about is my alkaline phosphatase above or below 200 simple as that exactly and it's actually again when i'm now supervising our students um, and i work with dr hansen and she wants these really really complicated new models of pvc and machine learning and artificial intelligence i say you know if we had the time and money the way we should be doing this is going to sit in clinic, talk to patients and talk to non-specialist clinicians and ask them what they want. Yeah. How should the risk tool look like to them? And it's actually why we've just published a very a fun paper of my traffic light paper. And I yeah. called it and I could I knew I would I was going to struggle to get it published because the people who review it are the experts rather than the non-experts. And yeah. I just called it the ABA tool. You know, what's yeah. your age? Is your bilirubin normal? And is your ALPFOS? Yeah. above a certain level and those three things on the first day that you meet someone with pbc gives you a lot of information and more than enough that a, a simple for, for a non-expert to hold in their head it didn't require machine learning yeah um and it, it required a back of an envelope uh, it's called clinical judgment. Young people don't recognize it anymore. But yeah. but it goes back, we you know we are agreeing with each other. But if you've got everybody, everybody in Canada or the UK being managed by those criteria, that would do far more good than any new therapy would do with PVC. Exactly. And you know, and we and we learned that from the days of managing blood pressure. Yeah. And you know, all the studies showed that if everyone's blood pressure was just slightly lower, 
didn't have to be perfect, more people would live. And we need to sort of translate that into the rare disease world, which is a bit harder. And so just to finish off in the last yeah. couple of minutes, I think we should touch on fatigue and symptoms. Yes. Because you gave a great overview to it, but it really dominates the quality of life of our patients. Yeah. Okay. So you've got your trace approach, which is very helpful. You know, you've got this yeah. joint approach, but the patient has to own it. But what yeah. do you actually do in the consultation when the patient is telling you about their their debilitating fatigue, their their battery runs down too quickly, they're walking through treacle, um, and their brain fog. We're onto Fs now from Cs. Their brain fog and fatigue. You know, what are the little tips that you've learned from um, uh, many decades in practice that that means that the patient leaves the room feeling more optimistic? You snuck in the age thing, but you you hid it as many decades in practice. <laughs> yes. yes. Okay. So. So the answer is you spend time on it. So this is the main role that I do in the clinic because um, we've got clever young doctors who can manage, you know, algorithms and things. So I do the talking to people bit. So the first is to lay it out and to the first voice to explain what it is and what it isn't. And also to to challenge some of the myths that are out there with it. Um, and one of the important things is just to say to people that actually there are lots of other people just like them. So a lot of people worry that it's them and them alone. And so I think that's where, again, patient groups have such an important role to play. So shared experience. <clears throat> the second is I tell them exactly what we're going to do and the order in which we're going to do it. And they leave, therefore, with a plan. And already they're starting to co-own the solution okay so there's a lot of you know in a sense structure to it but there's a lot of setting the agenda in a positive way it's not neurolinguistic programming but it's not far off it you are setting an agenda for people and you tell them what you're going to do and you tell them the order in which you're going to do it so the first thing you always do is you say we need to get the disease under control because at the end of the day you know, that that will set the tone for the rest of your life with this. And actually, the disease getting worse is not going to help you. Um, so you do all of those other things as your starter. Then we have a standard pro forma we go through of the, of the things that I've seen over the years, again and again and again, making fatigue worse. So the thyroid disease, a third of our patients develop thyroid disease. We see Pretty much every clinic will see somebody with thyroid disease making their fatigue worse. We go into the whole topic of overlap, which we've not really had time to talk about today. Anemia is common. And then we look for those things that happen in people of the same age as PBC patients. So diabetes, for example. So we go through all of those things, find anything and everything that is treatable, because anything that takes something off the pile of causes of fatigue will lower the total pile so again we explain that to people so and it's extraordinary how often you find something else and there is a trap remember that there is a tendency for doctors to ascribe who don't see pbc to ascribe everything that you that you ever have happened to you down to your pbc and there are things that are plausibly connected and things that are not plausibly connected um, the worst example I came across was somebody who slipped on the ice and blatantly broke their arm um, and was told to mention it to the specialist in the PBC clinic the following day when they happened to be going along in a hospital where we, by the way, don't have a fracture clinic. So, you know, there's a sort of madness sometimes. So you don't do anybody any favours by lumping it all together. Then the real meat of this is then those three things I mentioned in passing, autonomic dysfunction, sleep disturbance and depression. 80 to 90 percent of people with bad fatigue will have one of those processes making it all worse. And we go through those step by step. Now, depression can happen. It is very rarely the only driver for fatigue. PBC fatigue is not caused by depression, but it frequently can arise and make depression worse. It's a cofactor and it can be treatable. And often it's frustration, worry about where this all goes in the future. So we take that one head on. Personally, I don't think that talking therapies particularly work for that other than the talk around fatigue that we we, we obviously do so we often use SR, SRIs and they can help people the biggest intervention we do is stop unnecessary antihypertensive so people with PBC tend to drop their blood pressure uh, often people have been diagnosed with high blood pressure earlier in life 
and have been on high doses of treatment and the PBC kicks in, they actually end up over treated. And so you often find people who feel dizzy when they stand up, gout palpitations when they stand up. That's a sure sign that your blood pressure is falling and the commonest cause is, is too many antihypertensives. Now, please do not anybody stop taking your antihypertensives on the basis it might be making your fatigue worse, discuss it with your doctor because you don't want to, you know, they were given for a reason originally. So you do need to be careful, but we very frequently do blood pressure monitoring on people and the commonest intervention in terms of medicine for fatigue and PVC is stopping antihypertensives, but please don't do it off your own back. And then the other big one is sleep disturbance. It's very common, daytime sleepiness, falling asleep in the evening, falling asleep in the middle of the afternoon. And we go through an assessment of causes of sleep. So quite a complicated area. And if in doubt, we refer people to a sleep service. But a good question is if you're falling asleep at night, sorry, not falling asleep during the day, and you're waking up at night and you are not snoring, it's a terrible question to ask your partners, but that's what we do, is if you don't snore, but you do have disturbed sleep, then the chances are it's a PVC linked sleep issue. And again, there are some interventions that you can give, but simple things, avoid tea and coffee. It's a British thing. You wake up in the middle of the night and you go and drink a cup of tea. Tea keeps you awake. It's madness. It's British madness. So avoid caffeine, avoid Coca-Cola, avoid tea after six o'clock in the evening, avoid energy drinks. And actually it's amazing how much sleep will improve. So that's the meat of the intervention. You should do the coping stuff actually for everybody because it is part of living with it. And even if you do find an intervention, as I said, you're gonna to need to rehabilitate. And then exercise is undoubtedly helpful, um, but people often struggle with it. And a wise colleague of ours um, told me once, I asked him how much exercise do people need to do to feel better? And he said 10% more than they do now. And so actually the good news for unfit people is you need to do far less exercise to improve than fit people do. So it's a, you're winning all the way. So step it up by 10% in terms of 10% more times a week, 10% more that you do, park the car somewhere a little distance away and walk. And it's that building exercise in over a long period of time. And it's the cumulative of those impacts. We did this years ago. And no one of those interventions improves fatigue statistically in a study, but the approach that I've just outlined to you is highly effective at improving fatigue. We actually studied that in our entire clinic before and after the implementation of the approach. So it's one of those things that medicine hates. They love a single drug, which you can put into a single trial um, because we don't have anything, but all the cumulative normalization as of many things as we possibly can is effective. And I lay that out to people. And the last thing I say is fix on a day when you can remember that day. It could be a birthday. It could be Christmas. It could be your summer holiday. And I want you, so we tend to pick the one that's closest to where we are. I want you to think and write down how you feel now. And I want you to revisit this a year from now and tell me how you think then, because that's your marker of whether you're improving. And it just sets an expectation about the time. It's painstaking work. It's what I would call good old fashioned doctoring, to be honest good old-fashioned medicine we don't have time for it in the modern world but it's it i'm fortunate i can do it because i'm an academic but it, i think people find it very rewarding but if you tut and roll your eyes and you know you get absolutely nowhere with it people have got to believe that what you're saying is going to be useful yeah so i should i think we should close up there but i think that's absolutely spot on i mean what what dave is saying is be logical when you practice medicine and be yes. systematic um, and not just focus in on, you know, uh, black and white, yet the, you know, trigger points that you write this drug. Now, drugs are very important in PBC, don't get us wrong, but actually for much of management of PBC, autoimmune diseases, overlap syndromes, all the complexities where we actually, because we don't understand what causes the disease, the best care I've ever seen is the most, is care that is logical, rational and stepwise and doesn't just jump to, to conclusions. And the other analogy that just quickly popped into my head, Dave, when you were going through the management of fatigue is that, you know, you've got your mobile phone in front of you, you're down to 5% and you hit that power save button, yeah. okay? And what you see is it's stripping away yeah, yeah, all the absolutely. apps 
in the background to maintain the last 5%. And suddenly you think, I didn't need that on, and I didn't need that on, and I didn't need that on. And the 5% lasts 100 times longer. I think that's that's what you've just described. Fabulous analogy, and I will therefore steal it. The one I use, my last comment, is a thing called the snake. If you go to our clinic, you'll find this snake shape uh, written on every x-ray form we have x-ray forms we just use them to draw pictures and it's a wiggly line like that and i say that is your body and how it works it wiggles up and down completely healthy is a straight line so what you've got with the snake is that goes up and that goes down and that goes up and that goes down so we're going to drop that we're going to raise that we're going to drop that and we're going to raise that so we're going to go from a wiggly line to a straight line and it will need lots of little interventions but it will get you to normal and that's the model yeah and just to say the other thing is just to finish off when we're talking about symptoms it's obvious that the body is better at detecting that something is wrong than the blood test that doctors mm-hmm. invented. Okay, because the body's been around for millions of years yeah. and yeah. has evolved. And so, of course, you feel worse than your blood test may measure. Yeah. Because your system is highly designed to succeed and yeah. measures things in yeah. very subtle ways that we don't even know exist. Okay. Yes. And I think and- that's where there's a problem because doctors believe their tests more than their patients. So people who have a heart attack will feel profoundly fatigued, okay? And it's a very sensitive sign. And the reason your body does that is because if you try and run after you've had a heart attack, you will have an arrhythmia and it will kill you. So it's a protection mechanism. Your body senses something is wrong and it tells you to tone switch down to protect itself. So listening to your body is part of it, but you can work your way back from it. But the art, remember, is about don't forget social isolation. I always talk about this now is that one thing people can do with fatigue is cut themselves off they don't go to work anymore they no longer meet their friends they t- they stop doing their hobbies and that can sometimes mean you've got more energy um, but it often means you do it at a price for the rest of your life and Gideon I'll just take Gideon's analogy which I do genuinely really like um, and of course what you do is you go into power save mode and keep on the things that matter you don't turn it off because that's actually completely counterproductive so standby mode is the right way because it keeps all the things you need but it but it so therefore you get 60 percent of what you want to need um, but you still have function okay so I think we should draw it to an end because we shouldn't forget that for, for Dave it's uh, you know nearly half past six and what that means in sort of Northumberland territories it's nearly supper time All right, supper. Uh, and uh, so we should let Dave get to his supper I think we should thank him um, uh, we can't give you a round of applause because it's virtual on zoom but that, that's a fantastic uh, overview on PBC present past and future thanks to everyone for listening in this has been video to to embarrass myself and Dave And so hopefully more and more people can watch it on Facebook and we hope it helped. And we thank the the, the Canadian PVC Society for for making this happen. And and thanks to everyone and have have a good day. And and remember in Canada, you have absolutely fantastic PVC doctors. You are incredibly well provided. I appreciate it's a very big place, bigger than Northumberland, I think. But you do have a network and a community of, of people who are absolute PVC stars. And across the whole country, which we're quite proud of. I mean, and, it, and across a, the whole country, absolutely. It's a country. People like Mark Swain have spent, also like Dave, spent their entire career focusing on something and really, really pushing hard. Andy Mason, um, uh, Catherine Vincent in Montreal. Um, really, there are lots of people, I agree. Um, okay, so thank you very much. And I will leave it to the technical people at the end who will turn us all off and turn us off from live Facebook. And Dave, enjoy your supper. Good evening. And um, Nice to to meet you all digitally and sorry for showing you NIHR strategy at the beginning. Bye-bye.